too. Uh, and it's great to have all of you here in the room. I know you come from all over the world. Um, many of, how many of you are European versus rest of the world? Europeans? Yeah. Okay, uh, rest of the world? Okay, like a quarter, something like that. And um, let me, Professor Pinizio just mentioned that uh, indeed I live in Britain. I, in fact, I'm a freak, if you want to know. I'm French and Greek, so, uh, but I'm married to a Brit, nobody's perfect, and I have to live in this country that has voted Brexit, although I campaigned very intensely for Remain. Um, and, um, and it's quite an interesting moment for us, obviously, in Europe. We say it's an existential crisis. Are we going to disintegrate? Don't worry, guys, we're not going to disintegrate if you love Europe. It's here to stay. It's a very resilient project. And it's a project that I've defended all my life in all these different capacities um, that Professor Benito was just describing. But, as you will see today, I want to take you to, into a journey of being critical about Europe, exercising our critical days. And let's start with Brexit. Let me ask you, you know I'm going to speak about Europe in the world, but here is Brexit. Give me some hints as to how Brexit relates to Europe and the world, to the questioning and the critique of Europe and the world. Anybody, just throw words or sentences at me. Come on, I just need to wake you up before I start, just to make sure you're not all on the internet and all of that. So I did ask a question. Anybody following Brexit? No one in this room? Who's following Brexit? Die, come on! Come on! Come on. Come on. Gymnastic. Who is following Brexit? Okay, who is not following Brexit? <laughs> who does not understand my question? <laughs> Guys, you're Europeans, most of you, and of course the rest of the world should care. Brexit, does it affect Europe's role in the world? Yes. How? Yes. And you just said two things that are your name? Yes, Simone. Simone just said two things that are kind of complementary. Said credibilities. That's the kind of normative idea thing. You know, what does it look like? A club that loses a member. Do you know that Britain is the equivalent of 20 economies, the 20 smallest economy in Europe? So in terms of GDP, it's like losing 20 countries. Well, wow, that doesn't look very good. You know, are you that bad as a club? But also a material answer, just simply. So it's both ideal and material. Other points? I think thanks to the Commonwealth, uh, the UK is also a, a bridge between Europe and other foreign countries. Cool. And what does Brexit change? Because after all, Britain could be a bridge landing in the, the EU. What's your name? Sabrina. Sabrina. Sabrina mentions the magic word, Commonwealth. You know, 1.2 million people all over the world, the remnants of the empire. Anybody from the Commonwealth in this room? No. No. You visited the Commonwealth. Oh, some hands in the back. You've been to India, you've been to many uh, African countries, etc., etc. So you've been to the Commonwealth, but you're not from the Commonwealth. Okay, so Sabrina raises the Commonwealth. Now that's interesting, because that is a bridge indeed between Europe and the rest of the world from uh, the British past. It's also a bridge to our topic today, because as you saw, I will speak about the post-colonial. And some of you may have noticed that during the Brexit campaign, but also after, there was talk of Empire 2.0. Okay, we won't be in the EU, but as Sabrina says, maybe we will be reconnected with our former empire. There were memos in the foreign office. It was kind of weird. Um, so, you know, we call it the post-imperial hangover. Because everybody goes, ha ha, you know, A, it's never, it's never going to be as close to economic ties as Europe. But B, the Commonwealth has moved on, guys. You know, they're doing their own thing. I don't really care about little Britain obsessed with this uh, beautiful imperial past. Nevertheless, there are times we can't be completely cynical. And the question is, I started with Brexit, we could start with any other question. This country, Italy, has a smaller, but then you care a past too. So, 
Are we talking about the relationship between individual European countries and their colonial imperial past and possibly their imperial future? Is that something relevant and how is it relevant to Europe and the world? So that's what we're going to talk about together today. And as I go along, just interrupt me if you will. In fact, I'll throw a few questions at you just to make sure you continue to be awake. Um, power versus value. So yeah, when you do your EU courses, or any courses for that matter, you think about power. Benedetta, my former student, is here. She knows I would say that, right? Okay, power. That was the most important thing. But as Europeans, we care about values, right? So what is the relationship between power and values? What is European power? How do you think about it? It's a very broad question. But, okay, let me give you two, a, a little starter, so just to, to, to get us there. If we think about the field of EU external action, can you see? Because there's some really nice slides. Oh, I don't okay. the slides. <laughs> no. um, so, okay, the field of inter EU into external action. It started, let's just start in 89. Um, and in 89, of course, we have the honeymoon, and we have the first phase of, of diffusion. The idea that somehow now it's our, it has arrived. Europe's our. The liberal global order is not just American, it's Europe, and we are going to invent it and promote our values in the rest of the world. But then 9 11, power shock. Power comes into the picture in a big way. And how does Europe react? Scaling up. There's a new constitutional convention, the new treaties, creating a service of foreign affairs. I'm sure these guys and girls visit you from time to time. For Federica Mogherini, of course, you have her, so it's wonderful, Italian and a woman. Wow, cool, we have a right. Um, so that's the period, the year 2000, when we start thinking about actors. How can the EU, which is a bunch of countries sitting around the table, squabbling and fighting all the time, how can they then turn around and be one in the world? Question. But they weren't. There was the Iraq war, and they weren't one. And it continues to be a case that our countries are so diverse that how do you define power for a group of countries that don't really agree on everything is a very difficult thing. But we're still there trying to scale up European power. And of course, uh, then by the end of the 2000, and with us in this decade, is our internal crisis. And we revert back to the old trope, which is internal obsession with ourselves. How we function, how we meet, how we take decisions, what are our institutions. Boring, boring, boring. And EU courses, you know, go all the institutions. Sorry, I'm sure. Of course. My guess is an exception. Exactly. Oh, no, but yeah, I'm just going to feel the power. The EU is obsessed navel-gazing internal, right? Well, we've come back to that logic with the crisis. And slowly we're adjusting. Um, and the question that is with us today is we're speaking of a new world order. How do we adapt this funny, funny construct that is the EU to this new world order? And of course, then we come back to my question, power. So where is you in that reconfiguration of the world order? Where, how do you situate European power? Just throw words at me or say something about where you think European power might be, what it's about. How are we powerful? Are we powerful at all? We do care. Sorry? As a market. That is our biggest power. Market power. We have a market of 500 million and we, we create conditions to access this market. And that's our core power. What's your name? Andrea. Okay. Andrea's, you know, core point. You went right to the point. Yes. Self doubt. Self power. Self power. I thought you said self doubt. No. But that would be relevant. <laughs> <laughs> Which is uh, an enlightenment value. Self power. In terms of culture and, like, I don't know, like, so our culture, and in fact, you know, we like to say, are we right? Um, sorry, what's your name? Kena. Kena. You know, that we kind of invented modernity thanks to not just the Industrial Revolution and before Enlightenment and all the rest. And we spread it to the world, the world appropriated it, and then we have a global modernity that is so European. It's a kind of, that's the ultimate soft power. 
And then that translates little by little with culture and, and other types of power. Yes? What's your name? Sorry. Uh, if I'm correctly, we can be a model for integration among other areas in the world, like South America or Africa. So we're the first regional integration animal, like a funny animal with member states. Don't want to give up my sovereignty, but want to pull sovereignty at the same time. Pretty schizophrenic. That's really, really hard to do, right? Sorry, I'm translating your EU studies in other kinds of vocabularies. Now, other regions, they kind of want to do the same. They want to uh, integrate with Xavier to get um, Andreas market power. That would be, that's pretty cool. Also, to stop fighting with each other and stuff like that. Um, so, they look at us. Whoa, Europe. Interesting. Europe as a model. We'll come back to this. We might want to question this line, won't we? <laughs> yeah, we will. Um, any other kind of power? Yeah, come back. From year 2000, Europe has been regulated as a normative power. Normative, so connected to soft power, but in a kind of more political way. Yeah, Manners and myself and others, you know, we've written quite a lot on this idea. We define the norm, the normal. Is this still true? What's your name? Jose. Huh? Jose? Julia. So my point is about uh, historical, historical points. Sorry, I can't see who's speaking. Yes. My point is historical points that concerns the mediation. You was uh, at the uh, at great merit to avoid the wars that were a priority of the, of the 19th century and create the power of mediation between the countries that were inside. But super, and these are historical points that probably we have to uh, we have to remember. And uh, and also today, also today in the global in the global wars in the, in the scenario in the most critical scenarios in the world. It's a very interesting point that Europe can be called a mediating power. Sometimes we also say back to Sabrina's soft power that we have the power of translation. We're translators in Europe. Hey, we're all speaking English. I think most of you in the room, it's not your first language, it's not my first language. Um, but you know, did you see Google? They got this new thing that now you can kind of like put it between two people and it will translate automatically. So we're kind of moving beyond English. Whoa, great. Uh, no, I love English. But anyway, point is, what we do in Europe is translate between us, first of all, in terms of language and mindsets and cultures and dancing and music and all of that, we translate. Now, politically, is was it Jose? Who was talking about mediation? What was your name? Julio, Julio, yes. So, mediating, yeah, that's what we did after the war. We got, well, now we've learned to mediate, mediate around the table, resolve our conflict but in a peaceful way, and know how to agree to disagree. That's very important. Europe is not always about agreeing. It's not always about harmony. It's about agreeing to disagree. Uh, but we know how to do this in a polite manner, except with Brexit. We're not being very polite these days. But, you know, that's what we're supposed to do. The rest of the world looks at us like China and Japan. And they've got these memory issues in a big way. There are memory issues everywhere. And they look at us and they say, hey, these guys did it with, between France and Germany and Italy. Why can't we do it? Yeah, true. So that's quite a power. But these days, hmm, we're losing that power a bit too. Let me um, then kind of add to this quite conversation. There is, of course, when, why we're saying that the world is changing, because of course we have a world of emperors, these guys. They're not very handsome, are they? <laughs> uh, but anyway, not my favorites. Uh, so we have this world of autocrats, and we talk a lot about this, right, in our IR courses. And so maybe Europe has this, in addition to market power, the power that we're the free ones, we've got the values. We don't have autocrats, supposedly, although we kind of have some mini autocrats that are tempted to do it. Um, so maybe that, there is a kind of, in that sense, normative power, a new version of the normative power, which is that we still at least pretend to believe in freedom. Um, but of course, you know, look at him. He, he seems bored. Oh, what a boring line, you know. Uh, we are the real guys. Hey. There are no girls in the world these days in charge, and poor Angela is going out of power. So we need some girl power here. But in the meanwhile, we've got these big guys, and they're bored. You know, 10 years ago when I started, when I would teach a course on uniform, I would say, are we G2? 
two and a half. There's US, China, but we're right in the middle, mediating, Julio. You know, and we can mediate between the US and China. Are we still relevant in that way? In this new geopolitics of sanctions and realizing a general counter hegemony of China? Well, let's ask, do they believe what we have to say? What will it take? Now, another kind of power is what we, you know, back to normative power, back to cultural power, and Sabrina, uh, the power of attraction. And in fact, uh, there's all these amazing maps, I'm sure you, you know these, these maps that are scaled on different criteria. So on happiness, on unhappiness, you know, we are small, that's kind of cool. And the world is quite attracted by us, in spite of our crisis and all of that. Um, so, of course, there's, there's a flip side to this religion. Maybe there's too much attractiveness of Europe, which kills a lot of people in the Mediterranean Sea, right? But it is still a power. Maybe a power just to be an old museum that the whole rest of the world wants to visit. Um, but it has its flip side. And of course, I used to talk about the power of the super powerless. You know, maybe that's the way to summarize this. Because we, none of you have kind of said, oh, Europe is a superpower. I have colleagues, or, you know, if you go to the council, I mean, they still sometimes say, you know, we're the third or some sort of superpower. Are we a superpower? Well, I think part of the whole story about normative power is to say, well, in fact, not being a superpower is itself a power. Because you don't scare people. In international relations, you don't study international relations. The security dilemma, in theory. You know, if you have defense capacity, your rivals become your enemies because they think they're threatened by you, and then you see their defense capacity against you, and it goes back and forth. This iterative thing about security. If you're nice and weak, you know, you had the nice girl down next door, well, no one is scared of you, so you're cool, you're super powerless, and you get power from that. And that's a bit the story of, of Europe, and of course it has been criticized over time, starting with Hagen and, you know, Venus and the rest of it. But the fact of it is, we are just, and this is a nice, you know, the peace map, which is uh, on scale. We should never forget we Europeans, we are the very small tip of the Eurasian continent, and in a very big world, and, we, and how do we see that? And why is it, was it important to rescale the world? Now, the background to this is that there are different political imaginations of Europe and the world. And I'll give you four, just, just for your, in, to see what you think will be when you grow up, well, you're growing up, you're all adults, but you know, as you, as you act in Europe, what is your political imagination of Europe? The French, my country, they still see Charlemagne's Europe, the Euro myth of the small Europe. After Brexit, many dream to make it just that. But that's a, a Europe of the past. What we've had over the last 30 years with this diffusion and all is a lot of what I call Euro lines, where Europe has asked, how far will I extend, either for enlargement or neighborhood policy in my lines? You know the Roman Empire. I don't need to explain lines to you. The, in Italy, there's this very funny, fuzzy border at the, at the end of the empire that is both in and out, protects the empire, but might also be a conduit for outsiders. That's the lines, and we've been really into the lines for many years, but that's of course in crisis, especially given that the fact that we're competing there with Russia, um, obviously. Now, the, an alternative vision is the spheres. They're not bounded. Europe sees itself as some bigger sphere. Maybe, you know, a northern sphere. Did you see that the Arctic now is kind of like now the first ships have crossed the North Pole. Did you see that? It was a few days ago. Some Scandinavian ship? I can't remember. This is really cool, guys. If you want to do a cool thesis, write about you know, the world seen see from the North Pole and that circle there. Um, and Europe might be part of that sphere. That will be a huge market power, oil power, energy, energy sphere. Now, but of course, the one that really exercises us these days is this other kind of sphere, the Mediterranean sphere, the, the North African sphere, the Middle East, Euro-Mediterranean era. That has also been part of our imagination for a long, long time. But that's a mess, right? Like, that sphere is the source of, it's the biggest source of instability for Europe these days. And yet, that's the one we really have to live through. So to escape all of these troubles that are regionalized, of course, Europe has dreamed, dreamt for a long time of 
with another kind of geopolitical imagination, which is this. That's the Europe as a model. And here as Europe as a model, we can kind of spread to the world, and our power is because we're connected around the world, right? Now, sorry, Andrea, but I need to give you a moment of my critique of the EU as a model. Um, the model talk. Now, we, we've heard for a long time of the model talk. And of course, we could ask, what is the model? You know, is it like the architect model? You reproduce Europe? Uh, or is it um, a person that you imitate? You know, my role model. So, you know, my children, they have this kind of role models. No, that's not true. Um, or is it the kind of model that simply inspires you, you know, with a painter? Models may be many different things, and you might want to reflect. I'm giving you little bullet points so you can kind of think about it for yourself and have different opinions for me. But the point is, yeah, there are many ways of being a model. The problem is, of course, when you say Europe as a model, what is this Europe that we're talking about? Is it the actual Europe, or is it what I call e-utopia? Very often, we project an image, the world sees us as diverse and tolerant and mediating and all of that. The model that we project, we think the world sees in us is what we would like to be seen as. Get that? Think about it for a second. So this is the e-utopia. And there was a lot of that in the 2000s. We imagine ourselves as we're not really, but we would want to be seen. Um, but is it, is when we say Europe as a model, is it what is in common between all our member states, more or less? You know, our social model, uh, the, our issues of democracy, legal model, well, what are we referring to? Or is it something more constitutive? Some of you may be in law, doing constitutional. So is it our constitution, our values and principles? You know, they're all listed in the treaties. Uh, or is it the laws that we have, or the rule of law? Or is it the method? In the back, is it that we sit around tables and agree to disagree kind of thing? Is that what the... So first of all, we don't really know what we refer to. Secondly, and we have talked about other regions. And indeed, when we say model, model for what? Sometimes it's just for individual countries. Turkey should imitate Europe. Well, it says, no, thank you very much. Uh, the neighborhood, you know, when we do things, we do it in countries, we say, copy our model. We really mean what we do in our member states, like welfare, or the law, or whatever. But of course, there's a different meaning, which is a much more similar level of the regions that Andrea was talking about. And indeed, there's a lot of studies now on interregionalism, and Professor Finito does a lot of, of, of that too, and brilliantly so. So, but we can ask that, of course, increasingly, these regions do two things. They, first of all, they say, well, we're not going to take everything that you do. And secondly, we have many, many better things that we do better than you. But of course, there's also talk about the EU as a model, has been for 20 years, 30 years, uh, for the global, global governance. What's happened with that? And when I, at the end, I will tell you what I, where I think we are with that. But global institutions, how could they imitate the EU in the way they pull sovereignty? So that's one. And of course, there's also, when you translate the model, there's a maximalist vision. We copy Europe, where Europe is a beacon. But you can also be more cautious and say, oh, Europe is a laboratory. Trial and error. Um, it's an experiment. It's doubt. Um, it's that we try and we fail very often, but look at that may be interesting in and of itself. Or maybe there's an even more minimalist notion of Europe as a model, which is as a toolbox. Maybe something we can imitate, but not everything. But even if you're very minimalist, you need to... There's also different languages that you study in your courses. Languages of translation between Europe and the rest. Stories of languages of power, and that's how we started. But of course, languages of multilateralism. Supposedly, we are mini multilateralism, and the world wants to kind of do like us at different level. There's also the language of federalism. I did a lot of work comparing US and Europe. That's a different language because it's about countries, however decentralized. Hmm, are we more like a federation? And of course, language of regionalism. All of these things, for instance, you as students, you study with different professors or in different books. There are different languages, different fields or subfields. And it's interesting to ask how they connect with each other. Now, I'm not going to have 
have time to go through that. But basically, when we talk about Europe as a model, there's a model talk, there's a critique, and I think what I do, and what some of my colleagues like Mark Fisher and Nar and others do, is a constructive critique, so trying to kind of have a third way. Um, and of course, model, we've talked about it already, the critique is both pragmatic, like, are you kidding me? We are in such a mess in Europe with the crisis and the multi-crisis, the tsunami of crisis, and we, is it even credible anymore to talk about Europe as a model? Um, but nevertheless, even when we say that, it is true that in the rest of the world, you know, maybe the supply side that we do is a bit dodgy or very dodgy, but the rest of the world is still interested in the European model as an answer to our global problem. Take an environment, for instance. So, but at least you want to question that. And there is a whole radical critique with a number of, of books that come back to the question of imperialism. And that's where I want to take us to for the moment. So I've given you, I've, I've taken you to this point in the lecture where I suggest to you, and this is you know um, one of my latest book, Echoes of Empire, where we try to compare different imperial logic, and we go back in particular, but not only in a comparative perspective, to Europe's um, imperial legacy. Now, what does that mean? So we're going to spend a bit of time talking about what this means. Um, <coughs> So, and talking about empire is trying to talk about the present of the past, or the presence of the past. And the question of how not only memories of what happened in the 18th, 19th century between Europe and the rest of the world affects us now, so the memories from the rest of the world, but also what materially is left from that. Some people talk about neo colonialism, but that's not right, because that, that paints one color of this story. And it's a complex story that we need to kind of take in a more subtle way. So my, what I suggest to you, and what I try to do in my work, is to say, part of this question of Europe's role in the world, and asking how we can play a role in the new global order, is to really take in our imperial past, think about the, the big questions, and then act in a way that reflects this self-reflectiveness about the past. And maybe that's not the only answer, but that's a very big part of the answer when you travel around the world. So this is a project beyond kind of denouncing Orientalism, beyond simply noting Eurocentrism when you're sitting in, in Europe. How do we decolonize ourselves, as it were? Now, to do that, we need to go back to the 19th century and ask, you know, what is, how do we want to ask, what is e-universalism? So, here I start you with a, does anyone come from China or Japan and recognizes this? I know you haven't had lunch, I haven't had lunch, I should have shown you. I really don't think. Uh, it's really good, actually. I, I was in Japan and I started eating that soup and I said, you know, what is it called? It's called, anyone? Namban. And that means southern barbarian. Why? Because they're like little bits of things that come to the center. And so what does southern barbarian mean? I love this expression. And this is a 16th century painting in Japan. So it says southern barbarians come to trade. And these were Dutch people coming from the southern sea of Japan. And when the Japanese encountered them, they were very various because they couldn't eat with chopsticks. And they were coming from the south. And you know, it's a really nice inversion that the Europeans were southern barbarians as they started their colonial Edna journey, as it were. Now, let's take the bigger picture and say, well, at the root of universalism is a kind of old sense that we, the belief that norms and rules develop in Europe uh, are largely applicable, even if adaptable, to other contexts. It's a very big old idea. And of course, there are non European forms of universalism applying your role to the rest of the world. There are beliefs. But the difference is that European universalism was a project, it was translating a belief into action, into going into the world and translating that belief. Um, and it's a, a project that we could summarize as unilateral universalism. So my values are sourced in Europe, 
And a strong version is that we can promote. It is values that define us and we promote to the rest of the world because we have this enlightenment inheritance. And it's, it goes back, you could go back to history and the late medieval Christian approach, but the uncivilized other, the idea that the other is an object for being civilized, goes back a very long way in, in, in the story of Europe. So, the, so if we have at the root of Europe a unilateral universalism, the condition of possibility, why is it like that? Why do we think like this collectively? So this sense of exceptionalism, who we are, that we are predisposed because of what happened in this continent in the last 500 years to promote certain values and principles. But of course you want to add to this our good old power. The Industrial Revolution, the way capitalism developed in the 19th century, I'm not going to go over this, and the material translation of that power. So you have to have all of these things to be able to have this kind of unilateral universalism. And, um, and the point here is that in the era of high imperialism at the end of the 19th century, what you started having and start to recognize the tropes that we still see today is a logic of gatekeeping. So we have the rest of the world, and you have Europe, Europeans, starting to create international organizations, like for communication or disease control or whatever. And they start having rules for gatekeeping. What makes you a nation or a group fit for sovereignty, fit for membership? And what makes you universally a nation where we can intervene to promote these values in very different ways? So this is a gatekeeping norm. And now, basically what does that create is something called, how many of you have heard of the standards of civilization? Standards of civilization, anybody? Anybody? Aside from Benedict, I would written beautifully about it. Well, see, that's really interesting. Where is your memory? Seriously, you know, this is very important. I'm not recording. But guys, at least today, there's one thing you need to remember, is that in the 19th century, Europeans codified the standards of civilization. You know, with Kipling, it was called the civilizing mission. But the standards were precise. They were legalized. There were standards that Europe established for the rest of the world. And that created a hierarchy of states. And that, so the two criteria, they created a hierarchy of states that more or less apply these criteria and denied their agency. That's very important. I'll come back to this in a moment. But here are my standards of civilization. They're about what the government of India looks like or Algeria. They're about extraterritoriality. These people need to be sophisticated enough to accept my extraterritorial power. It's called capitulation in anybody who works on the Ottoman Empire. That is, hey, I'm, I'm a colonizer. I want my private property to be respected, right? And also my embassies, etc. But I'm going to make a lot of money by going in your country. Sometimes I have uh, armies. Sometimes you're not really a country anyway. It's very complicated. But the point is, I'm testing whether you accept basic rights from me, asymmetric, of course. Then I look at your customs and diplomatic opportunity law, etc. But the point is, all of these are about um, gatekeeping. So here I have my 21st century standards of cooperation by Europe. Now, when Europe goes in the world and, and uses and has market power, you know, it has conditions. And it's a very interesting exercise to look at what the EU promotes in the world. There are good things, right? We like good governance. We, we do, right? We like human rights. Kind of like these conditions. Investment rights, hmm, well, that depends. Uh, but we promote values, practices that have to do with our presence there. And these are kind of sophisticated, maybe more democratic version of the old standards of civilization. Now, of course, it's not as simple as that. We've had the in-between something happen, and it's called decolonization. We live in a decolonized world, so it's not as simple as that. Now, you can't see, but above there, the title, I don't know, it moved. It's, a, it's called Europe's Virgin Birth. Why well, it's not as simple as that? Because when Europe was born in 1957, we have nothing to 
do with the colonial past of our member states, right? We just, we just warned them. We're as virgin. Now, actually, it was 57. There was still a lot of decolonization to be going on till 74, the last with Portugal. But, and indeed, that was reflected. How, who has heard of Queer Africa? <coughs> Anybody? Come on, you have to move. Yes, one person. That's, that's a start. Um, that's Benedict Africa. Uh, so, actually, what you should know is that Europe, Africa, the idea that there would be a continent, Europe plus Africa, was the biggest inspiration for the creation of the EU in the 50s. I mean, okay, no more wars on the continent, everything you've learned in your courses is kind of true. But one of the greatest reasons why member states wanted to create this Europe was we need to pool our sovereignty in order to pool our colonies. Let's have economies of scale, especially in Africa. It's a big continent with few people, lots of resources. We're going to integrate so we won't have war and we'll have this kind of, not back office, but back territories, or I don't know how you call it. That, and that was called the Euro-Africa Project. And if you look at the Schumann Declaration and all that is there, and then it was erased. And that was one of the fascinating process of the 60s was to forget your Africa, um, to deny that past. And in fact, some, at some point there might have been maps also with even countries from the North Africa that were part of the EU, Algeria, but those disappeared. We've forgotten that past of the EU. Now, in fact, uh, what we it, it did change because the old standards were global, and EU membership said, you know, EU was we retreat on our continent and our neighborhood, and we create these new standards of cooperation that we were going to say something about. So when the EU dealt with its former colonial world, it got into this logic of denial of the colonial past of its member states, redirection to us, and to being a, a, in the Cold War to kind of survive between the US and the Soviet Union. And then there was something called atonement. We're going to help these countries develop. We're going to try to make good on some of the exploitative behavior that we had before. But this atonement had its limits. Now, the modus operandi of Europe as of the EU as an enlargement neighborhood and even the rest of the world is of course always centered. We still have this graduated gatekeeping. And by the way, when I say this, you might think, what's wrong with that? And maybe you're, oh, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's what we should do. But we need to be self-reflective about how we do this. So when we deal with the rest of the world, we always correlate degree of convergence of the other with us and degree of access. So if you, so minimal convergence to have our aid, <coughs> to have trade liberalization, to have people, and if you're even better at Ukraine, you can get visas, everyone wants visas to get in Europe. At the end, you become full member. But the point is, it's always correlating how much you're like me and how much I give you access to me. That's the logic of graduated gatekeeping in Europe. So what I want to say here, and I, this is from an article, you can go back to it, but the, the last point of this bit of the lecture, and then I'll kind of roll back, is that if you look at what the EU does around the world, I would like to urge you to always say, as in everything in social science, if I ask you a question, how much do we reproduce 19th century standards of civilization that went along our imperial past, I would like you to always answer the following. It depends. Can you all always say it depends? And that's the one thing you want to remember from this lecture. Always say it depends. Various. There is never one answer. It depends what issue area we're talking about, what country. So if, there, if, if the EU does something which really creates a lot of hierarchy and denies the agency the power of the other side, then it's very much an analog. There are different degrees of analogy between our past and our present. And we can spend time and come back in the Q&A to all these different types of, um, of analogy, of areas, neighborhood, accession, relations between regions, they are more or less close analog. So now, 
switching gears. I'm sorry, I'm taking you to different bits of this whole very complex work. Stand back, take a deep breath. Now, so as you can start to see, my work and what I present to you today is part of critical, critical EU studies. Now, you study Europe and the world, and here EU's external action. Now, these are five different areas of literature that you read on EU external action. And in yellow is the kind of the amendments if you don't want to do critical study. So we've got all this stuff, what kind of power we talked about. Here I suggested that you need to think about the narrative behind it, what we want to project. Are you self-reflective? Secondly, global IR, global history. Now we've these the last 10 years, 15 years, and I'm sure in here here when you study international relations, got this new thing of global IR. Let's not do international relations from our Eurocentric or US-centric viewpoint. Um, and that's very important. Um, because and we connect with global history, that's a burgeoning field. And in that, we just say, well, let's focus on the normative term. We're not just describing the world. We're not just even analyzing the world. We need to ask, what is my normative benchmark? Do I like this or not? Is it right? Is it wrong? According to what criteria? Thirdly, you have the whole literature on external governance, promotion of X, of the rule of law, of democracy, of human rights, of market values, etc. Uh, and of course, the critique there is that this whole diffusion literature is unicentric. It's from us to them. How come it's not both ways? We talk about a multilateral world, but you know, okay, we describe what the EU is. So your critique has to be always at two levels. What the EU does, do I like it? Is it right? Does it work? But not just does it work, is it right? And then, do the scholars that I read, are they critical? Is she critical? Is she just taking it in and describing it? Third, fourth, global and multi-level governance. My God, how much do we read about multi-level governance? Now there the problem is, again, it's a very hierarchical notion of governance. And part of what we need to think about is horizontality all the way down, including between individuals, all the way down. Our studies of politics and international affairs tend to look at states and organizations. But hey, we are in the world of distributed intelligence, the internet, and all the rest of it. And, you know, I'm an old hat, I mean, I'm not that good at it, and I still have to get a Twitter, you know, going, but I'm pretty good on Facebook. But I do a lot of things on the internet, and I try to follow the internet, um, democracy and all the rest of it, that is the most exploding area that we should connect to international relations. And that's about horizontal links that don't necessarily go to structures. And finally, you have the activist literature, which uh, is still very status, still very much assuming that for Europe to be an actor, it has to have one voice. How many times have you heard one voice? Europe needs one voice. Bullshit, you know, why do you, why do you, sorry. Excuse my English, but I also have written quite a lot about one voice, a critique of one voice, because in many ways, you know, if when Europe negotiates on climate change, it has different accents, different ways of connecting to different people, maybe slightly different messages. It's complicated. We don't always need to have one voice, because that's because we want to think of ourselves as a nation state, as one big entity that has one voice in the world, just like Trump. But who wants to be like Trump or these autocrats? So the big question there is whether Europe can actually benefit from its diversity in acting in the rest of the world and not have you know, nation state and not having a European nationalism as the key to its power in the world. This is not the right key. So it's a very, very quick map, of course. It's more complicated, but here we go. Now, in that there, there in that landscape, this is where you know I have been written and, and developed with a number of colleagues this kind of post-colonial approach. And part of it is to work with normative power and and manners and others. But the problem with normative power is that it continues to have a kind of hierarchical subtext. We have this normative power that we give to the world. So part of the question is, can we criticize and, and, and deal with the universalism 
uh, without this connotation of we have this normative power, civilizing mission, which is so problematic. By the way, I haven't said that until now, but of course, if you go around the world and speak about Europe and you go around and ask people, what do you think of the EU and the EU power? That, that is still, well, you know, you know the story about the guy who was walking and finds his old friend in the street and for half an hour he tells him, you know, hey, you know, I haven't seen you with him for, for so many years, you know. I was on TV yesterday, did you see him? And then he goes on and on and on. And then after half an hour, he looks at his friends and says, hey, my God, for half an hour we only talked about me. Let's talk about you. Have you read my last book? <laughs> so that's a bit what the EU does when it goes, when studies say, hey, we're, we're not Eurocentric. We go around the world and we do perceptions of Europe, right? From the rest of the world. But still perceptions of Europe. I mean, I'd rather go in Rio or in, uh, you know, in Bombay and kind of walk around. And you'll see they just don't talk about Europe. They're indifferent about Europe. Europe is nothing. It's very small and irrelevant. So you don't go around and say, you know, have you read my last book? When you're in the EU and want to understand your place in the world. I'm being facetious here, but there we go. So that leads us to the talk about the post imperial condition. And what I want to make clear to you is when I talk about post imperial condition, I think everything I've said should kind of get you there. Is post has two meanings. It's understanding with your gaze as you look at the world, post as we are, we come after that past of ours and we need to understand how the rest of the world <laughs> perceived us in this post-imperial world. Um, whether we have colonial DNA, whether they perceive that we have colonial DNA, versus post in a normative way. Post as overcoming something that I really want to be post. I want to be a power that somehow overcomes that past and that is able to decenter. Now, I'm going to skip a lot of things that are still coming because I'm sure Professor uh, Finistia will be one of me to open up, although we've had interactions already for a QA. But can I continue for yeah, another yeah. few minutes? Um, right, so because I want to give you some examples. Uh, we're going to pass on political theory, right? We're going to pass on political theory. Uh, Decentering agenda, I have stuff written on this, you can go back to it. But we, we with Fisher and now we go through the three levels, you provincialize, you engage with the other side, and you reconstruct European foreign policy. I can give you all of the references if you're interested, because I want to come to examples. Um, two important points I want to make before I give you examples. This is not an anti-realist approach where the realists say, hey, you're all obsessed with these ideas, these are second order issues. But it's not true, because first of all, Europe is not a, net, a construct of warriors. Now, yesterday I was with Solana at the EUI and we were talking about Europe's new defense, but we're not, we're not gonna have a European army anytime soon. That's not what Europe is about. So it does act through these rules and we want to ask what is behind it. Um, and we want to be aware of cultural nationalism. Um, but realism, the problem with the realists that you hear, let's say you're going to have a visitor from Washington, they have this declining Zeitstack. So what they really are obsessed with is here in the West, we're declining. They accept that, they're realists. Um, China is rising, and therefore conflict is unavoidable. That's the realist perspective. And of course we want to be aware to conflict. But if we really take seriously a post-imperial condition of Europe, what we're really trying to do is to say, well, in this new coming complex multilateral world, it's not just distribution of power, it's distribution of ways of doing politics, of regimes, indeed, the autocrats and all the rest of it. How do, you, how do we as Europe best engage with that world? And best engage is in this post-imperial way that I suggest. Um, recognizing the other without necessarily accepting everything about the other. And of course, it's not also relativism. Oh, whatever you do out there is cool, fine. You know, um, we, do, I, we do have a critique of the so-called rescue narrative. You know, colonialism of the Brits in India, what was it about? It was white, white men rescuing black women from black men. That was kind of what they, when they said, you know, the, the, the women burn themselves on the, on the spire when their guy dies, you know, what a silly thing to do. And we saved the women, you know, we the Brits came in and we saved them from these black men. 
the, the truth of it is there were lots of local movements in India trying to fight this, and then the white men kind of went on top and did their own thing. The point is, there is a kind of rescue narrative of Europe, and it is very problematic, and we could talk a lot about how, for instance, we intervene on gay rights in India, but we are the ones who introduce homophobia in India or Nigeria or other places. Fascinating. That was Christianity for you. Oops, I'm in Italy. No, I'm just joking. Um, but you still have the crucifix in the classroom. Anyway, um, so, but I still want to rescue the rescue narrative, right? I don't want to say, no, well, that wasn't really cool, but, and it is hypocritical. Nevertheless, you know, I, 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 if, if there is uh, something called responsibility to protect, I'm for it. I mean, we don't want to, we are citizens of a global world. So we want to ask the question, how do we rescue the rescue narrative from this worst tendency? How do we rescue, and, or the other example, um, you know, we go to Africa, the EU, one of the areas I've worked with a lot with some doctoral students is the economic partnership area. Anyone works on trade and economics here, economic trade, trade relations? You're not raising your hand, I'm being too long. Um, so, economic partnership agreements, for 15 years the EU has been wondering why do these Africans not want to sign these new regional trade deals with us? Well, you know, if you get into details, you'll see that the EU is trying to kind of impose in Africa a certain way of first of all organizing yourself in regions, sometimes cutting off countries that were not cut off beforehand, um, in saying we know developers better than you do. So, you know, you've got these African economists that are like, hmm, we know our supply chains better than you. It is very interesting the way in which European and African negotiators interact on this. Here I wrote double decentering, because double decentering is, is to say, if we want to decenter our perspective, to take the point of view of the other side, it's not necessarily to the state. Double decentering is that, you know, I decenter to try to understand what happens and what the viewpoint is from um, Uganda, but maybe inside the state. The actors, the women there, the children, what are they living through? And what do they need? So, just a few examples, non-systematic. When you, we go to our neighborhoods, say in Ukraine, decentering means really going there and what you hear is what they really want. It's not necessarily just the right to become EU members or to stay with Russia. They want the right not to have to choose between the two. Not the old spheres of influence kind of approach. That's sometimes what they want. Or in Syria, if we think about responsibility to protect, how, how low do we go in, in bypassing the state? So these are you know, big questions. But what I want to get at as I close is the, the eternal question of the war between nomads and settlers, because we're in Italy and we have the migration crisis here, and in fact that defines our politics, doesn't it, in the last few months and years. Um, so here is just also the case of, you know, you can think of humanity as an eternal war between nomads and settlers. And in Europe, it's a funny thing, because in our world, settlers have won. Those who don't move have won. You know, the world is divided in nation states. There are not that many movers across borders anymore. But in the EU, what have we done? We have re-institutionalized the victory of the nomads. Only 4% of Europeans, like me, live in another country in Europe. But the EU is all organized around our rights, our rights to move freely, internally. And then it has a problem of schizophrenia, because if you do that internally, you have to protect externally. So we have a very complex nomads versus settlers bargain in Europe these days. And of course, it's happened you know, for, since the beginning of humanity. It's the same thing. Um, but the thing is, when we have these refugees, what do Europeans see? They see this guy. They're not quite sure. You've got a boat here, and there's going to be a terrorist there. So we have to keep them from entering and then keep them from moving inside Europe. And we all understand this is not sustainable. I'm not going to go into detail with that. A different attitude, of course, that's a Banksy thing. You've seen it, very classic. Uh, that's the, the, the counter, right? Re refugees welcome. This is what Europe is all about. This is what our past is about. 
But of course, this is a picture we took in Lesbos, in, in Greece, where you have refugees arriving, and you know, who cares? So it's a question of very, how do, you, how do you start engineering a new normative gaze on the other in Europe? It's a huge question, and we could, again, come back to it. Um, so in terms of policy, I just wanted to suggest that what we see now is there are these areas of policies, interdiction, circulation, and integration of refugees. And right now, we have all sorts of policies that we're discussing at the European level. How do we manage external movers, refugees? You know, we pull our border management, we externalize borders to the rest of the world, etc. I'm not even going to go into the detail. But when you start thinking in terms of decentering, you start thinking very concretely. So what I want to try to say to you as we close is that these have very concrete policy implications, being a policy imperial power. Um, from interdiction, how do you deal with others who want to come to Europe? Well, some people even go as far as saying you have a duty to exclude. Because, you know, in Britain, we, half of Uganda's you know, nurses are in, in, in Britain. Doctors, they have been trained at very high cost in their country and they come to us. And is that right? So we have to think much, much more deeply about co-development. And that in turn leads to circular migration. It's very important. Circular migration means if someone made it to our shores, to our beaches, and they get a status one way or another, but they want to go back, maybe to be with their family, maybe to work back home, they need to know that they can come back to Europe. It's only because they will know they can come back to Europe where they also know people and have invested that they will go back home. So a big part of the agenda in the next 30 years is going to be to organize circular migration in, in, from Europe and around Europe. Um, circulation around Europe, similarly, and I'm, I'm going to uh, pass that, but finally, the, one of the biggest threats facing us today, and you're young, and hopefully you know, you've got to have, have lots of babies, but you, those of you who are Italians, you're the worst in Europe, you know that. Um, we first were the best, hey, we have lots of babies. But still not enough. In 30 years' time, we will need about 100 million migrants to pay for our pensions. And you guys will be kind of getting close to there. So you better get going, but that won't be enough, even if you all have lots of babies. We're going to need more migrants. And we have to think about our relationship to the world around us also in this way. So we can only think globally if we are decentering. Um, and if we think globally, of course, then we have all sorts of debates at the global level. In finance, in trade, in environment, I'm going to skip them. But in all of these areas, we need to ask, how do we create international regimes that serve us and that force the other side to adjust? Creditors, debtors, etc. Um, the last one where I was very uh, involved, the nuclear treaties. The nuclear treaty says, you know, nuclear powers, they don't adjust, they do their thing. It's non-nuclear power that adjusts. Well, a year ago, we had a nuclear, universal nuclear ban treaty we start having the revolt of the rest of the world. And the question for Europe is how do we decenter, how do we understand their viewpoint in this debate? Because we, we were not present. So, beyond all of this, decentering means understanding how in the rest of the world, the mind works, how people see space and time, how do they think about the world. And that's also obviously a very complicated and philosophical um, challenge. And finally, the challenge is for our field. When you study, those of you will do PhDs, etc., you want to go into, think about what global international relations is doing. Um, you want to think about how to link the sociology of international relations and the field. And what the new dawn of this new multilateral multipolarity means for us. Um, so that would be the, my last point. Guide for action. When Europe acts in the rest of the world, it needs to ask not only the what, which standard am I trying to promote? Are they adapted to the other side? But how 
are we promoting these standards? Am I over-exploiting my structural power? And ultimately, if you believe in a world that is democratic and decentered, you always want to come back to the, the requirement of neutrality. Nothing we do as Europeans should be unilateral. It should always be about asking what the other side, how the other side sees things. In an agonistic way, there's conflict, obviously, but that's the new cosmopolitics. And I hope that we can together think about how this new cosmopolitics um, will take us to a better world. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. We immediately open the floor to, to your questions, thoughts, and uh, so you can ask uh, uh, what you never dare to ask about, uh, you know, about uh, everything about Europe that is and about uh, its role in the world, you know? To, uh, yes? Please critique what I said. Yes. <coughs> Say your name before you. You're Africa. Yeah. Speak louder so everyone in the back can hear, but I'll repeat the question, don't worry. I will try. And uh, the idea is that, yes, the European integration was set to, uh, to encounter it somewhat, to develop that link with uh, the empires and the, let's say, the ex colonies. And now we have an international actor, which is China, that is going to, to enforce this. Recently, we have in the um, I mean the summit in China. We have like six billion something like that credits for the two African countries. My question is, what is the perspective for the European Union, and what is the role it is going to play in this? Like in this country, it's China. Yeah. No, and it's very important. You heard it in the back? China and Africa? You know, we had the Are You Africa? It didn't go too well. Now China. Should we come to China and Africa? What should we do? And he's totally right that China is all over the place in terms of investing, especially in infrastructure. And of course, what is Chinese compared to... Some of you have an answer to this question. Have you worked on China and Africa? There must be a specialist in the room. They will do it. They will do it. Uh, yes. Yeah, they're just starting. <laughs> China. Very important. Sorry, China? China has become a major credit card for most of the So it goes in there, absolutely, and it builds infrastructure. And why is it better than Europe for many countries? No conditionality, no standards of civilization, no respecting our human rights, not no using the market power of China or whatever. China just goes in and says, hey, we'll build roads for you going to ports. And that's pretty cool for countries, especially when they have autocrats, etc. Nice, you take your money, you build our infrastructure. But of course, there are limitations to this um, logic. It is attractive, and that's why a lot of countries take in China. On the other hand, when you put conditions, you know, at the end I say black standards, yeah, well, you don't want to impose your standards, but if you don't think about standards at all, adapting, being sensitive, understanding the other side, there's a problem too. The Chinese go and they have all these workers, they create little cities. Anyone has traveled in Africa and seen that, it's fascinating. They'll only have Chinese workers, Chinese food, you know, Chinese little things, and they don't really interact with, with the local population. Of course, if you try to impose conditions, you have to interact. I'm saying we need a middle ground. You need to be respectful with the local country, but you still need to understand, you know, what is, what are the constraints for who is exploited? Do we really need this road from A to B? Because of course, you know, the other crowd will say from my town to the sea. The result is that a lot of the Chinese infrastructure pro uh, project apparently are pretty low quality and not necessarily what the country needs because there hasn't been enough of that kind of glue. The glue can be agonistic, it can be conflictual, especially if it's conditional. But there is this interaction. So there's very interesting contrast between the Europeans and the, and the, and the Chinese in, in, in Africa. 
And of course, in part, it depends which country we're talking about. And if it's Ghana, the Europeans are more listened to. But, and if it's Nigeria, less, and etc. Uh, but indeed, it's a, it's a very interesting challenge for, for Europe. Now, the thing about it is that Europe thought, well, we would, as usual, we institutionalize everything. We just don't just go there with corporations or whatever, public par private partnership, and do things. We say, well, that's how it's so we did these economic partnership agreements. It says, you create regions, and then we'll you, you will liberalize your trade to Europe. Now, and that's the big condition that Europe is working on these days. And it hasn't worked. First of all, because they resist. Their, their industries is still not strong enough to take in all these European imports. Um, and, and secondly, because again, Europe created all these conditions. So we have to find a middle way between the Chinese kind of blind brute force infrastructure projects and the Europeans' old conditionality and find a new way of mutually interacting with countries um, where we do the things. Yes, Andrea. But wait, you had your hand up. No, no, no. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, but Andrea, you've, you've spoken before, so before I take you, um, questions, comments, you know, not just questions, you know, if you want to comment on what I said, any part, um, Andrea, sorry. And then, how am I going to go? Yeah. Uh, to, to the market, to the Europe as a market, and, uh, and the, the different model of Europe as a welfare state. So Europe as the creation of uh, it's an historical, I mean, historical fight between the popular class and the uh, upper aristocracy and upper classes, which may which given uh, which has given us social social democracy, we can say. I've uh, got two points, uh, two, two questions. One is uh, how can we, um, if you think that uh, the um, the frontal attack all on uh, this idea of Europe, which has been uh, which has been what I mean. The, uh, the idea of Europe, which has made us uh, big in uh, in this century, uh, could lead us to to decline. So if we if we just embrace uh, uh, because we have to embrace also economic question, if we just embrace uh, one uh, one economic uh, one economic line, one economic theory, which will lead us to the destruction of our uh, welfare state. Uh, can we still be uh, a power and uh, can we still be a model for outside? And, uh, you mean if, if we're too neoliberal? Did you mean neoliberal? Yeah, yeah, neoliberal. Yeah, okay. and, and if we, uh, and the other, the other point is, uh, should we be a model on welfare state? Or, and stemming from the first question, that is, should we be a model? Uh, on the welfare state, right. Our welfare state is in trouble. Right, and partly um, because it's, with globalization, it's very hard to continue to <coughs> you to have so much taxes, etc. Because there's competition between corporations, and they're based on taxation. And, and part of the big challenge for Europe in maintaining some degree of welfare state is indeed to cooperate on how you tax corporations. And one of the things we haven't spoken about today very much is. Um, how European power will not just be European power vis-à-vis -vis other states, but the extent to which the EU can assert public power vis-à-vis -vis corporate power, the Googles of this world, etc. And that is a great challenge and a key to our power. Um, but what you're asking, Andrea, is the extent to which, you know, are we declining economically because all of these problems with adapting our welfare state and uh, asserting power vis-a-vis -vis corporations. Now, let's kind of accept something, guys. We are declining. Europe is declining. Every, every measure of relative power, we are declining. GDP, percentage of GDP, we went from 25% to, you know, 7%. GDP per capita with the emerging countries. There are, there are measures where we're not quite declining, like health, child mortality, um, measures of happiness, <laughs> or whatever that means. Um, but more or less, at least in hardcore economic terms, Europe is declining. And the question is, A, can we still be cool about it and happy and have a nice continent when we have good lives? 
Uh, I mean, that's okay, you know, if we're relatively smaller in the world, if we still have the dice. And the second thing is, as power, power, do we decline elegantly? Do we decline, we're still pulling above our weight? You know, or do we do it well? Something that's unavoidable, it doesn't mean it's bad, you know. We all die at the end of the day. Do we die elegantly, you know? So, the earth is not going to die, but we have to manage our decline. That was part of my point with the, dem the demographic time bomb. Because, you know, we want to maintain a certain way of life and a certain belief in equality and just social justice, etc. And that means that, you know, as people grow old, you have to have old young people and intergenerational justice. That's what we want to do. And we want to actually be the continent that really shows the world how to do policy long term. That's what we need, whether it's the environment, but anti-nuclear, a lot of these big issues have to do with safeguarding our continent and our planet for the long term. I believe that the EU is very well placed to be the guardian of the long term, to be the guardian not just of your lives, but of your children's lives and children's children. And that's very hard because politics is a short-term thing, as we see every day in Europe these days. So Europe, perhaps because it's less democratic in a different way than its member state, can use this, the fact that it doesn't have European elections every other day, to care about the long term. And so it is this elegant way of declining, contribute to the world, contribute to safeguarding our planet, etc. But we can't do it by telling the world, hey, we've got the solution and this is how we do it. So the, the best example is the COP21 in Paris two years ago on environment. Some of you work on climate change, environment, interested in it. You're all interested in it. Who's not interested in global climate change? That, no, that's how I'm going to ask the question. Who's not interested? So you're all interested. Well, COP21, do you know, had a fourth pillar. It wasn't just states who were saying, we're going to fight against uh, carbon emissions. The fourth pillar, anyone knows? Stakeholders, yes, Jared from Morocco knows those things very well. It's too important in Morocco. And um, that meant cities, regions, making commitments, group of people, but networks of cities. So we're, we're not just talking about states. And there, you know, Europe was also leading that, how cities can commit. You know, in the post Trump era, it's the cities in the US that are committing. Um, but a lot of these innovations come from Brazil, they come from um, the East, they don't come from Europe. And we have to, as Europeans, just, that's what we started to do. You know, take in all the best practices from around the world and then apply them to us. So elegant decline is also accepting that we can, you know, take lessons from what is being done around the world here, as with this example. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I want to ask you, thank, thank you first of all for this seminar, I want to ask your opinion about uh, you know, the decline, the European decline, if it maybe comes from uh, the people themselves, they feel unattached to European global coordination, but actually there is a, a feature, a big feature between what the people need what they actually, actually in Europe is. Because every day you had the opportunity to explain us all the aims, all the goals to Europe attaining actually, but most, most of the time people just outside here as normal citizens, as normal people, just not understand what Europe really is. So actually the disinformation between the normal people and the high level governments is just killing you. So let me ask you, but anyone else, what do you think should be done about that? Making people in the European. I don't know, I'm, I'm living a normal way, I live a normal life, like everybody here. And uh, most of the time when we face people which didn't study or well, they are living life in a normal way, not able to understand life in a more high way. They just stop themselves and they are getting a refuge in a in a populist. But no, they don't really understand 
because they don't understand what's real, is trying to tell us, and what is the really importance of global governance, uh, coordination, and integration, integrity in, in our goals. So actually, this is, this is actually what, in my opinion, is the real problem, and the real, the real root of the European society. And I'm glad you're sharing this with us because, of course, you're plunging right into our current European politics. Um, and I'm with you that Europe doesn't really communicate and connect with its citizens very well, in part because those in Brussels are pretty old guys, most guys and girls, and they don't really you know, connect with the new world that you all represent. Um, and we do have lots of social movements in Europe these days, um, everywhere. People who do take initiatives, um, like my friends at Pulse Europe or Another Europe or you know various groups around Europe, but they're of course minority group. They're still people who want to do something. But so things are moving. Politics are fluid in Europe. But there's several caveats. I hope you got from my lecture, because my lecture is Europe in the world, and you're bringing us back in. So first of all, one connection is the best friends of Europe is those who criticize the EU. I am tired, and you know, um, uh, Professor Finizio was talking about the Spinelli group, and of course we're in Italy, so we love Spinelli. I don't think Spinelli was a classic federalist, mm -hmm. and at least the new Spinelli group, and people in the European Parliament, they're what I call unreconstructed European, very often. For them, it's very, very simple. You know, you're with us or against us. You want more Europe, you're with us. You want less Europe, you're against us. I, I know, because I interacted with them. And when I say, well, you know, sometimes maybe we need less Europe on something. Sometimes we don't want a coercive Europe, which tells Greece what to do in every area. Maybe Europe these days has to deal with Italy in more subtle ways. You know, um, the European Union cannot become a power which um, is colonial inside. I didn't give you my definition of colonialism during the lecture, but colonialism is in very short, and remember this definition in the future, governing at a distance, governing others at a distance. That's what colonialism is colonialism is, whether you use force to invade a country or not, but you govern others at a distance. We live in a world, not only because you know we've had decolonization, self-determination, etc., but it's our basic instinct, all of us as individuals, we want to govern ourselves. You know, I have a 17-year-old, I have two, two, two kids who are adolescent, and I tell you, my 17-year-old daughter, she'll slam the door of her bedroom in my face and say, taking back control, I want to govern myself, you know, and every parent will understand what I'm talking about. And some of you are not very far from that phase with your parents. We want to self-govern. And if the EU becomes something seen by its citizens as wanting to govern its member states at a distance, whether we are talking about Athens or, or Rome's, Rome or Warsaw, it's not going to work. Now, I'm not saying that the member states are doing the right thing. I, oh, I hope for Europe where its citizens, the, the kind of politics that we should hope for for Europe is that citizens connect to Europe to vote in their regions and countries to have their countries be, take policies that respect the others that respect their externalities, if you want to be technical, that are other-regarding political philosophy jargon. So I want a citizenry that knows how to do that. And that happens in many different ways. Of course, it starts with schools and media. But it starts also with the way in which, for instance, you do referenda, the way in which uh, we in Europe now have the citizens' initiative, where you have to have one million signature from seven different countries. That means citizens talk across countries. And they say, well, we, if we want to deal with um, pollutants, you know, there were different types of petitions, how do you see it in Italy? I'm in Spain. Or how do you see it in Estonia? And citizens work together. That's brilliant, because this is citizens in different countries learning how citizens from other countries see things. Brussels is not that interested in that. Recently, I was at the European Parliament talking about European Citizens Initiative, and you can see that Brussels wants to control them. They're like, well, who are these citizens you know, telling us what to do? 
So, and I could give you many, many examples. So citizens have to be empowered and take their destiny in their own hands. Brussels has to listen and resist the old demon, the old temptation of centralizing, which is really basically what's happened in Europe for the last hundred years, thousands of years, thousand years. Whether it's Christianity from Europe and papal dominion, you know, all the wars in Europe were always about the fact that there was somewhere a power that wanted to dominate the rest of Europe, wherever it came from. The European Union is not just a post-war project to have peace, yes, but what does that really mean? The EU is an anti-hegemonic project, internally. It's about safeguarding the little countries like Malta and Greece and Luxembourg from the big bullies in the room. Italy is in between. Um, so that's what the ideal of Europe is. And when Brussels, and it's a very, very old story in European history, the temptation of dominion. So when Brussels reproduce these old stuff of trying to dominate at a distance, of course it's going to create populism. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you know, populism is the fault of Brussels. But technocracy and populism go hand in hand. They reinforce each other. And each of them, the populists and the technocrats, they think they know better. There is one people, one Italian people, one European people, whatever. And I am a technocrat in my office, and I know what the people really need. I know what the public good is. I'm a populist. I'm Salvini. I know. I can tell you what the Italian people need. And of course, both sides, what do they give up on? They give up on pluralism, the chaotic, effervescent beauty of pluralist democracy. That's what they do. And in Europe, what I'm hoping is that you guys and all these movements you know, will reassert the force of conflict and conflictual politics and pluralism. And I hope technology helps us and ideas help us and schools and media, etc. So that's kind of my long-wielded response to you, but, but the last footnote I want to give is that don't listen to me. <coughs> it's not about me saying, you know, this is my answer. Every single one of you in this room needs to find their answer and how you want to act, how you want to go beyond acting with likes and, you know, the parallel lives we live in on, in our little private bubbles. Uh, and then there's the state out there, and we're in between. We have a little private bottle, bubble, the state and the institutions. What do we do in between? Well, it's for us to reinvent. And there are as many reinvention stories and imaginations as, as number of people in the room. So it's up to you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry.
the people who work with her, uh, who work with her and people who are uh, against the EU. They are not the same in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, it's a very important point you're making, and, I, and very much my mindset, that is, you know, we all need to be critical. Why are you students? You know, you're students because you want to exercise your critical minds. That, that's basically, you know, all that we can do, right, as professors with our students, is simply to just have you exercise your critical mind. And the problem is very often in the EU mainstream, when you have people who are critical, like I am of Europe in the world, um, or internally, I mean, or everything I do is, crit is critical. And I love the EU, and I'm the greatest defender of the EU. But sometimes people call me a Eurosceptic, and you're just like the populists, etc. Simply because you're critical. So I think that's one of the greatest battles that we need to fight, is that you know, being very critical of what, how the EU operates, both internally and externally, is a duty. And, and we need to continue. Absolutely. Okay, so, uh, yes. What do you say? Yes, we are... I want to know what you think. Uh, Tell us what you think. No, I mean, no, there is a question there, but we have 30 seconds. Something like this. Do you want to put a question? Yeah, really short. Yes, very shortly, yes, please. Uh, I want to say, I want to say, how can we expect, uh, how can we expect workers or uh, uh, an unemployed to, related to this question, uh, to get, uh, to approach European Union in a good way when... Give us two more minutes yeah. for Andrea's question. Please. When they don't when, have... When they don't have anything in the exchange, when, when I mean, when there is someone, when the European Union is uh, crystallized uh, around uh, an economic project which is just one economic project. We could talk about, about conflict, no? Uh, it's not, uh, we, we, it's not, we cannot conflictualize uh, European treaties. This is something that, um, that, uh, that, I can say, that makes people go away from, uh, from identity, from, because it's not politics. So it's the no, that's, that, absolutely. I mean, that, that is... Make, so, it's interesting. Note that, you know, here we are in the series on Europe in the world, but we are always coming back to Europe internally. Yeah. And, of course, that's normal, because how you project outside depends on how you are inside. And we're always talking about consistency between inside and outside. But our force inside is the precondition for acting globally. So the last three questions open up a whole huge other debate, which maybe one day we will have, uh, on you know where our Europe should go internally. What's going on in Italy these days with the you know conditions on the budget and the looming, looming, very big confrontation? between Rome and Brussels, and behind that is what Andreas Point is making, Tina, there is no alternative. The idea that Europe has this new liberal liberalizing project, which never really took care of the justice implication. Europe, as the EU, has not taken care of how, what it does, what it asks its member state to do, what it implies within countries. Does it make some people poor? So in, in Greece, for instance, the Troika you know, uh, was the most detrimental, the, the memorandum, for the 80 percent, you know, for, for, the 80, for those who are the poorest. That is the case. So Europe needs to be both more interventionist in looking at how its policies impact the poorest and the unemployed, and yet more respectful of social contracts of its member state. These social contracts, they're all, they come from trade unions, from politics, local politics, local elections. They're, they're, they're the very basis of our union is what happens in domestic politics. So the EU should do no harm to national politics and respect and maybe empower those that are most vulnerable. And we're still very far from there. That's where we have to take the EU, and only if the EU start to change in that way, I think, can we really continue to decline elegantly. Yeah. Okay, so we are at the end of the lecture, Calypso. So thank you very much. And uh, and by recalling what uh, what we were saying, you know, that is that is the future is in your hands. So don't forget it.
and the Europe is in your hands. Thank you very much, Calypso, and uh, great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Yes. And thank you. And thank you.